I'm not going to speak about um, molds and uh, varnish, so I have to disappoint you, but I will maybe touch into other aspects that I think also are important in this craft of uh, violin making. Um, so I, I thought I should just start with a small uh, introduction of myself. I um, uh, played the cello since I was a small boy, eight years old, and, uh, and that's how I came into violin making. Uh, at the age of 17, I made my first uh, cello. Kind of bought a book, How to Make a Violin, and I made a cello, a bit larger. And, um, and then at, uh, yeah, after high school, I went to Cremona as the first, first Norwegian to, to study there and had five really nice years there. Um, and came back to Oslo in the summer of 2000. So I've been in this workshop you see here for 20 years, wow. People is, uh, I mean, time is getting by too quickly. Uh, and I'm uh, focusing on making new instruments, uh, most of my time. So what I was going to talk about today is actually how we can use violins as an edu educational tool for kids. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, how you're going to uh, play the violin because that will be up to the violin uh, teacher, of course. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm a dad myself. I have um, three kids. Um, and, uh, you know, when I go to school, I always feel a bit, it's a pity that children today, they don't, they don't really get the chance to, you know, uh, work with wood anymore, like we did in school. And uh, maybe um, it's, it's hard for them to get, you know, exposed to this kind of uh, work. So I think it's a really good um, opportunity to, you know, work with orchestras, local orchestras, and, uh, and interact with kids in this way. So I will um, show some of this here, and I will sh also show some photos of, uh, of the work I've been doing uh, afterwards in a short presentation. But I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, so I, I uh, prefer talking directly to you. And I, I, I wish you were here. I'm, I'm trying to imagine you here now in my workshop. Because uh, it's a bit uh, strange to talk into a screen. Um, uh, so, how it started, it was actually back in 2012. Uh, there was a, a children festival in Oslo, and they asked me if I could come there and set up like a small tent and, you know, present violin making. And I said, well, it's, um, it's kind of hard because, you know, violin making is kind of it's not easy to present something that is a bit, well, a bit, let's say, nerdy or uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard, you know, to explain in, in a few words for kids. But, I, you know, I, I took it the, the challenge and we had to work together to find a way to, you know, work with the kids and show how to, uh, you know, interact with violin making. So um, uh, I made some, um, some uh, designs on paper. Uh, which I will show you afterwards, um, which we handed out to the small kids. Uh, they could actually, you know, for the, you know, uh, like really young ones, like four to six years old, they could just put some color on, on a violin on a piece of paper just to get started. And then for the bigger kids, they could um, design their own violin. So I, I just uh, had like the, the fingerboard and the, and the bridge and the tailpiece on a piece of paper, and they had to you know, used their fantasy and well, I, I'll show you afterwards, they had some pretty great designs uh, coming up. And, um, and then of course I tried to introduce some woodwork as well. And, and that's also great fun because, you know, I just made a uh, big box of pieces of wood, like uh, some spruce, and I bought some of the small violin making uh, planes. And uh, it was funny to see how all the different kids were kind of, you know, trying to play in on this small piece of wood. And uh, of course, um, nearly all of them cut their fingers and uh, were, were bleeding. But, uh, you know, they really enjoyed it. And it was really fun to see how certain kids, they could, you know, be at, at the bench for almost an hour with one piece, small piece of wood. They were kind of hypnotic, but others, you know, all the kids were just, you know, yeah, doing like that. Now I, I'm not 
I don't manage, so they're just you know walked on. Um, so you could clear, clearly see that this was you know talking to some of them. Um, and then of course I gave some demonstrations there, uh, you know, explaining how to make a violin um, in in very let's say simple terms or simplistic. And um, and this yeah it worked out really well. So then. A couple of years later, I was asked by the, the Oslo Philharmonic. They have like a, a family day. Maybe you have it in your own country as well. It's, it's basically a, um, a day when uh, the orchestra is opening up the, the concert house. All the musicians will be around the house, uh, you know, doing small demonstrations in groups for kids. And um, they can try different instruments and stuff like that. And, and then, of course, we also made um, a violin making stance. So we kind of adapted what I did at the, the children's festival. It's family day. Um, pretty much the same um, activities, but I wanted to add something more because all the kids were asking, but you know, I'm tired of uh, playing at this small piece of wood. Can we, can we make a violin? And I said, well, that takes like 200 hours. Um, but they really wanted to do something. So I came up with the idea of, of making a mini violin. So the first year I, I made this really tiny, small violin here. I will show you a photo afterwards and share some, some uh, links with you. Uh, so it's, it's basically, you know, just a mini violin. It's, it's cut out um, by laser. So I went to, you know, the a big workshop in Oslo where they have a laser cutter. So it's just a thin piece of spruce. So I made around 500 of these, and uh, and that was kind of the beginning. So you have you had a very basic design of the violin, but you know nothing more. You could the kids could even color it if, if they wanted to. So the year after, they asked me to come back, and uh, you know how how can we, can we bring this one step further? Uh, and I said, yeah, why not let, let the kids make a violin or, you know, at least pretend to. So then after a lot of thinking and, uh, and some design work, um, I, I put to get, together a, a design and, and ended up uh, with something like this. So it's, it's basically, um, well, it's still the mini violin. It's, um, it's about 20 centimeters long. Um, this one is made in, in plywood of poplar so it, it cuts easy with the laser um, of course I cannot you know cut 500 violins by hand so uh, uh, but you know just doing this with laser takes a lot of time um, so I, I, I made the design this is um, um, you know you have you have the basic uh, geometry of the violin you have the f holes you have the you have the fingerboard so I will show you a small video afterwards how the, the kids actually were going to uh, put this together. But I, I can show you briefly. Um, so I even made a small bridge. It's, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, there it is um, in, in maple. So th this one gets then inserted into the, uh, the hole here of the, of the mini violin like this. And it's kind of uh, resembles a three a three dimensional uh, violin okay uh, but then we had to add strings as well okay um, so I, I bought some of this um, this metal string which acts like uh, like a string for the kids and then basically they had to and and this one was, was great fun to do with the kids because then they can actually, you know, make something and spend some time with the violin. Um, and when it's done, they will bring it home. And usually we make it with with the logo of the orchestra that I'm I'm working with. Uh, this one you see here is the one when Claudia were visiting, the, the one from Stavanger. Um, so basically I, I made four holes here at the tailpiece and four holes at, at the scroll. Okay, so with the help of the string um, and um, and a small toothpick, so then you insert the string into into the first hole, and uh, and then you you glue in 
the, the two stick, stick from, from behind like that. Okay. And you just break it off. It's very easy. And then the kids then have had to, you know, wind this, the, this steel metal string acting as a string, you know, up and down on this mini violin. And it actually worked out really well. Um, you know, in, in four hours, we managed to get, we, we had like a long table there with, I don't know, maybe 20 kids working at the same time. Um, so they could, you know, work on this and uh, they were very proud afterwards and they, you know, they showed it to their parents and said, oh, uh, look, I made a violin. So, um, so that's, uh, that's, um, this is the kind of latest uh, generation of, of mini violin that I made. Um, and it's, it's, it's not that hard, you know, once you've made the files and you have everything up and running, um, it's far easier than when you do it the first time. Um, and then again, last year we said, okay, so we, we have done this uh, mini violin project uh, sometimes uh, and it's time to evolve uh, once again. And, um, and the Oslo Philharmonic asked me again, so what can we do now? No, you, we have to engage the, the kids a bit more. Okay, so then I said, but why not? Uh, let's order some uh, cheap factory violins and, um, and disintegrate them. I mean, not for the kids to, to smash them or, or anything, uh, but I prepared them in a way that they could better understand how the instruments are made, okay? So um, I had quite limited time and, um, and I had, you know, I had to work quite fast and with crude um, ways, uh, which is, you know, for violin makers, it's, it's not easy to, to do something fast and a bit, you know, um, not too nice. Um, so yeah, this, this is one of the violins then, uh, which I basically just took a saw and, and cut in two. It's very, it's a very satisfying feeling, I have to admit. <laughs> and um, and then I added some magnets, which you may see on the on the video. And then it just, you know, it snaps together like this. And uh, voila, it uh, looks like a violin. I can even hold it in my in my hands. Okay, so magic. So that's uh, that's one part. Um, then we made, or I made, um, another version, which is uh, very useful if you lose something inside the violins. Um, you can just, you know, take off the back. Very easy. Still with the strings in place. Um, I actually tried to tune it at the beginning, uh, but then of course <laughs> the whole top was kind of uh, <laughs> um, deforming, so I had to put like a, yeah, a small bar here at, at the back. but. Um, I hope the kids didn't notice too well. Uh, so there's basically just a magnet here and an upper block. And you know, the, the same with the back, one, one magnet on each side. So maybe this is the way we should start making violins. You know, you don't need pins to locate the back, you just use magnets. So yeah. it's very easy, right? Um, if you have questions, you know, just uh, I think Claudia will help us to uh, to get them along. I, I will, you know, uh, take them as them as they come. Yes, don't worry, we are still there. We okay, with you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Very good. Uh, okay, and then uh, this one was the first one I made. Um, this, um, of course, we can we can do the famous sound post joke if we want to. You know, if. If you want to improve your violin very quickly, and we all know that fitting a sound post, it's a very tedious process. Uh, I suggest that you, you know, you just uh, pull off the sides uh, of the violin uh, like that. And uh, then it's very easy actually to just, you know, reach in and uh, adjust the sound post. Yeah, you know, like that. So, well, apart from the jokes, um, it's a great way to, you know, show show the kids um, how a violin, you know, the, the basic parts. So this again, it's uh, it's all with magnets, just goes together like that. And uh, this one is actually almost in tune. Well, yeah, can you, can, uh, it's actually nice if you could play it because it's a nice demonstration that you made on a video where you actually remove piece by piece. It's very interesting, actually. Okay, sure. Uh, I'll I'll grab a bow. Okay. 
And, it's, 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 and especially the joke with the open sound is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> So uh, then again, of course, I, I should have made a bow that I could, you know, break in, <laughs> but I didn't do that. Excuse me. Um, let's see if we can get this baby a, a bit kind of tuned. More like hard on fiddle tuning, I guess. Yeah, it's, it makes a bit of buzzing. Okay. I'm a cellist, so I, you know, I warn you. It's, this is not going to sound very well uh, without the chin rests. Mm. Okay. Yeah, this sounds more like in Hadanya Fiddle. Okay. Claudia asked for open sound. <laughs> you, you like this better, Colin? Okay, so let's take out the lot of this. Um. Yeah, what do you it's, think? It's, it's buzzing more than on the, the video you made, and it was not buzzing like this. And it was actually very interesting to know what makes the quality of a violin. I was surprised because the first half you yes. were more, it actually makes little difference. The mm -hmm. second is, is, is enormous, but the first half was actually very surprising. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. I uh, I can I can send the link to that video later. I think maybe it was tuned up a bit higher last time. Okay, but yeah. it was quite interesting to to think about it because it was a bit surprising. <laughs> the event. Because then at the end, of course, you have like a pocket violin, so you lose all the bases. But when yes. you only one half, quite the, 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 the interesting thing is, of course, you don't lose the bass because you've got all the higher partials that are, get the fundamental you know, it's just putting it through a loudspeaker that doesn't have a low frequency response. You still sound the bass, but it's not, it's a bit weaker. Yeah. But that's Slightly all. weaker. <laughs> it sounds actually still like a violin. <laughs> but the quality, the quality of the sound is not very good at the moment <laughs> on, on, on these things. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. I really recommend you to, to watch the video because you managed that it was not buzzing and it's actually very interesting. Yeah, I think my, you know, my microphone was uh, straight uh, under the violin, so that's, ah, uh, yes, that's, I think that's, that's the that's main problem. Uh, okay, so I will just quickly uh, show you some photos of the, you know, finished uh, violins with, uh, uh, with the kids. If I'm able to share my screen, let's see if this works. Okay, um, can you see? Yeah, it works. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so this is from the first festival. Um, you know, the very basic color um, thing for the smallest kids. Um, so uh, you know, I kind of, you know, drew a violin freehand. It doesn't look very, you know, uh, it's a bit artistic. Let's put it that way. Uh, on this one, uh, this was actually made for the kids to make their own ethels. So that was really great fun because they, they did all kinds of stuff, uh, you can imagine. And then th this one, of course, it's even better because here the kids can make their own body, uh, you know, with colors and everything. Um, it, was, it was great fun. Um, this is a bit for the older uh, kids. Um, this is actually... A, uh, it's a bit inspired by, you know, uh, Francois Denis' uh, book and, you know, the method of drawing um, a, a violin mold or form. Um, so I made a, one sheet with a description on how to make it and then, you know, with the compass uh, for the older kids between, let's say, 10 and 14, they could do this easily with, with some help. Um, this is freehand uh, designing of, well, based kind of freehand uh, FO uh, 
uh, design. Uh, so this was actually quite uh, funny because most kids are used to drawing straight lines between between two points when they do this kind of um, sketching. Uh, but here they really had to, you know, concentrate to make like a nice flowing curve and then at the end to see the, the finished effort. Um, <laughs> yeah, here you can see some of the <laughs> creativity that was really uh, outpouring. It's, um, it's, it's great fun to see. Uh, that's the small violin. And uh, yeah, this is basically the one I showed you uh, you know, before uh, the, the finished file, I, I just drew it in uh, in a drawing program, and uh, then you can send this file straight to the laser cutter. Um, yeah, this is the same. You see, with the with the bridge that goes into the slot. Um, and here I can show you a small video. So this is a uh, it's a time lapse. How um, I. I Uh, then of course it would be a bit more correct to make like with four different strings, but we we just use the same string back and forth going up and down uh, in order to mimic um, the four strings of uh, of the violin. And uh, it was fun to see, you know, some kids they they understood this quite straight away, uh, but others were you know completely lost, and so were their parents. <laughs> so. Um, Yeah, I, I will link to this video afterwards as well. So yeah, the last string in and just glued and uh, and that's it, it's finished. So um, looks easy, right? Okay, so um, any questions to this um, educational um, project before I move on to the next uh, subject? Yeah, go go. Yes, Colin, go. Can, can you make a violin um, with very strong magnets that, that you can put the neck in on and off to make it small enough to get into the cabin in an, an airplane? <laughs> That's a good idea. You know, I, I actually, um, many years ago, I, uh, I was making like a, a violin as a joke for, a, for this festival in Stavanger because they had like, um, like a gala a concert the last evening. Uh, so I made... I made a violin where I could basically, I, I had like a small button on, on the back here. And so I could push a button and then the, the neck was falling off while I was playing the violin. And it was so fun to see the <laughs> on people's faces because the neck was then, you know, dangling just by the strings and people were just like, oh, what happened? The violin broke. So, uh, but I, 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 I should try that with, with the magnets. So. Maybe it works even better. <laughs> uh, other questions? Okay, good. Anything in the chat? Do you see something in the chat? Oh, the uh, chat is just saying, great, yes, it's amazing. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah, uh, I, I have a, uh, uh, ah. yeah, sure, I, um, I have a, um, really enjoyed doing similar projects with children also, um, and found that musical instruments is a wonderful platform for engaging uh, all kinds of subjects and topics. Um, and I'm, um, I, I've, one thing I've actually uh, played around with is um, having uh, the children make uh, actually playable instruments um, from solid, uh, solid uh, wood, we use a spruce or something like that for the body. Um, and I'm wondering if you've actually tried um, uh, actually making playable instruments, you know, playable <laughs> um, in, uh, you know, in quotes. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for the question. I, I actually, mm, I did something similar, but I, I was kind of preparing uh, in order to show the, the principle, you know, of the vibrating string. So I made uh, different, very simplistic uh, designs, uh, some with resonance box, with some of them without. Uh, but that was more for the kids to try them. And uh, we didn't really have the time to make them. But um, yeah, it's a great idea. I, I would love to hear your experience. You know, if, if there's a way to, to make it quite relatively fast for the kids, 
and still make it work better than, of course, you know, this this mini violin. That that would be even better. Um, what what I found found is there's something about I get to hear the sound yeah. that, that sort of compels them forward in the process and, and, right. and the look on their face when they hear it, even even if it's not it, it, any sound. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Quality. Who cares about that? It? It's just something is happening. Uh, just the the their face lights up, um, and so. Um, Anyhow, I, I love what you're doing. Thank yeah, you so much. And we, yeah, uh, feel free to. Uh, my my email is my name at Gmail, so uh, okay. I'll, I'll I'll put it in there. Yeah, I'd love to talk more. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I would love to to share some ideas. Uh, you know, I like I said in the introduction, I I think it's a pity that many kids today. Uh, I mean, my kids have iPads, but you know, they also need to you know be physical with. Uh, materials and uh, you know the sensations of woods uh, even you know if you're four years old or 15 years old it doesn't matter uh, they need to get exposed to this but it's it's harder and harder in 2020 to do this so i think that's one important part and uh, and of course you know uh, showing the wonderful world of violin making i mean kids are so open-minded you know and and they make so many interesting questions um, so yeah, that's, I, I hope more more people could do that. I have found I have found that I can get teenagers to get up in the morning if they know they can get to work on their own electric guitar. Oh yeah, great idea! I'll, I'll try that. <laughs> we we titled the course "Annoy Your Parents." Yeah, <laughs> I guess the electric guitar will be a, a bit more appealing than violins, <laughs> at least for my kids. <laughs> Jacob. Uh, yes. Somebody was asking, what is the range of uh, age? Uh, well, basically, uh, from five, six years old up until 15, 16. Yeah. So, you know, for the smallest one, the basic like coloring things on paper uh, and for the for the most grown up, you know, the mini violin is is great, and then you know the um, designing your violin with the compass. That uh, is actually a bit hard if you never if you never tried it. Okay, thank you. I think you can okay. move on to the next project. Yeah. Which okay. Is really, really new. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's brand new. <laughs> it's just finished. I, I'm, I, last week I was a bit, you know, uh, drained out on batteries, but now I'm, I'm regaining uh, energy and, and, uh, and that's really good. So um, I will talk a little bit about this uh, mus music festival uh, and that I was uh, hosting and uh, arranging. Um, so, you know, we have to rewind time uh, a little bit back to, to, to see the background of it. Um, Cause in 2010, I, I wanted to do something special. I had been, you know, working in this workshop for 10 years and my instruments were, you know, out there. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to see nearly all my instruments on a regular basis. Um, so that makes a lovely interaction with, with the musicians and, and my instruments and, and see how they uh, develop. So, so then in 2010, and I asked uh, all my customers if they would you know come to Oslo and and join me for a weekend and and play in uh, one big orchestra and um, and yeah the, you know the feedback was really positive uh, at that time I, I didn't have a budget to, to pay people so I said okay if you want to come it's great if not uh, uh, that's we'll do it next time um, so we had a really, really nice concert in a, in a concert hall here in Oslo with around 25 musicians on stage. Uh, it was a nice mix of uh, music students, professionals, and also uh, also actually some some amateurs. Um, and it was just a lot of work organizing the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you know, even I'm, I'm though... surprised. I'm surprised. This organizing. <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you will be quite. You will be, be charged out on Saturday as well, Claudia. I believe. Me. <laughs> oh yes, I am already now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so you know, after I did the concert and we, I even did a small recording. I gave a, a CD with the concert to all all the musicians involved, and uh, we had a great big party, and it was great fun. But I promised myself that I will never do this again. 
but then you know 10 years uh, is passing by and uh, and i said okay well you know 20 years in the in the business it's it's time to to make a party or something then uh, and i thought well i, I cannot really do uh, the same thing as last time uh, so i was actually before uh, well, last year in 2019, I was planning on having like six different concerts in Oslo uh, throughout the year uh, with uh, different small chamber music groups and, and solo players. Um, and, you know, like spread out through, throughout the year. And I also wanted to um, have uh, three of my former um, trainees. Uh, from Belgium and uh, the UK to come to Oslo for a week and and make a violin in 24 hours, but that is not now post postponed to next year or after Corona. Anyway, uh, you know, I started planning, uh, asking different musicians if they wanted to join, and this time my my goal was, you know, to focus less on me as a violin maker and my instruments, but you you know make to put another perspective on, on this. Um, so I, I've, I, I thought that, you know, we should talk more about sound because, you know, that's, uh, and that's, that's what's also what is great conference, uh, which uh, you Claudia is, is organizing, you know, we, we are focusing on sound and we should, of course, making a nice instrument in, in the right manner is, you know, that's the basic of what we do. But you know these are musical instruments, and um, and and the sound is really number one. So I said, okay. So I I would like to focus more on 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 the the interaction. I mean, when we're talking about music, we we often talk about either the composer or the performer, but we seldom talk about the instruments. Um, so that was kind of my. I angle into this and when I started applying for funding because at this time I wanted to pay the musicians and uh, I, you know I cannot do that by myself so well I I spent uh, some of the winters to write applications to you know different uh, public funds and private sponsors and stuff like that and and that's a lot of work because you know you have to make like an application of four pages and you know really explain why you are doing this and and nobody will do it i mean nobody will give you funding if you say that oh you know I, i've been in the business for 20 years and i want to throw throw a big party <laughs> so I, I really wanted to explore the sound of uh, the instruments i made and kind of see if there was some kind of de development you know in 20 years of making uh, from how, what kind of music uh, should be played in which venues. So I, I also started doing research in Oslo about, you know, lesser known music venues. And I found some really pretty spectacular uh, places. I, I will post some audio and video later on uh, when I have the energy back. <laughs> um, uh, so, well, then the Corona hit. And, uh, you know, I, the musicians, they called me and said, well, what's going on? And I said, well, I, I don't know. It's, it's impossible to do, to do any concerts in, in these conditions. Um, and then in August, I said to myself, okay, well, you know, Corona or not, we have to do something. Um, so I said, let's, let's compress these six concerts into one festival. Okay. So, so we will do uh, eight concerts in in six days um, and because of corona we will have you know a smaller audience um, on every concert uh, but you know like two or three concerts every evening um, and um, uh, that was carried out yeah two weeks ago and um, Again, uh, <laughs> it was a lot of work because if you don't have anyone you know you can hire to do uh, the, the planning and the you know contracts with the musicians, uh, research the venues, uh, doing sound checks, uh, try to get some some 
press uh, some attention because you you have tickets you need to sell in order to um, at least go in without losing money. Um, so you know the timing with the corona was not too bad because there was less pressure in the workshop on, on the making and I had a bit more time for the festival. Um, so I yeah I, we had eight concerts in four different uh, venues and uh, it was interesting to talk to the musicians you know how they felt uh, playing together with all the musicians that are playing my instruments and which they maybe hadn't met before or they didn't have a chance to uh, play together with. Uh, with. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure if it's uh, an important part of it, but of the instruments I made uh, since um, 2000, uh, all, almost all of them are made from, the, from two uh, logs of spruce. So I think that maybe, I guess, the, um, uh, researchers here can can tell me a bit more but uh, in my mind that's kind of a a red line through my uh, making uh, yeah progress uh, but of course you know i also have to add that i've i've moved from uh, copying uh, you know strad and guanera and then in 2011 i i started uh, making my own uh, models for violin, viola and cello, but that's another story. Um, but, uh, you know, it was really nice to, to hear them together and, um, um, yeah, try to, it gives you a, a very good understanding as a maker, you know, what, what works with a certain musician or a certain model of instrument and what doesn't work. Uh, and, and then, you know, bring that into your uh, everyday work at the bench. That's, uh, I think that's a huge privilege, uh, privilege. And I know that not all violin makers today can do that. Um, so, yeah, uh, for those who can, it's, it's really nice. Um, yeah. Yes, I was wondering if you could tell a bit about how did you choose the repertoire and the venue? Or was it something that you discussed with the players and how, and, you know? Give a bit yes. of insight how you built the program. And... Yes. Um, you know, kind of halfway through the project, I, I, I realized that I didn't have like an artistic director. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't uh, hire a musician to kind of overview the whole thing. Uh, but I must say I'm, I'm addicted to music and I listen a lot to different kinds of music. So I'm, I felt like that's something I could kind of oversee uh, in, in the dialogue, uh, dialogue with the musicians. So firstly, I, I sat down with, with uh, kind of a list with all, the, all my clients and I, and I was thinking with myself, you know, which musicians could fit to a certain repertoire and, uh, or to a certain concert hall. And then I started this dialogue and, and that started you know, more than a year ago. So then, for example, for one concert, um, uh, that's, a, that's a, a married couple. Uh, so, you know, he's playing the piano and she's playing uh, cello that I made. And they have been working with Beethoven because of the Beethoven uh, anniversary. So that was quite clear that, okay, so we will do a Beethoven evening. And, and then I found this really, well, at least by Norwegian terms. I mean, uh, this this old building, <laughs> um, like 300 years old wooden building, which was you know owned by a very rich family in Oslo, and they actually invited French and Italian musicians to play there. I was told back in the days, um, with nice acoustic, and so you know the Beethoven fitted really nice into into that hall, uh, or let's say room. It's a quite small chamber music. Um, room that fits for that um, and then uh, I made another concert at the, at the same hall uh, uh, the day after and, and there I kind of tried to merge a program with uh, uh, music students um, because it's important to you know show the new generation of uh, musicians um, some established ones and uh, even some of the the older, uh, more experienced uh, musicians. So it was really fun to see how they, you know, interacted backstage. And uh, uh, so for that concert, uh, the program was really um, 
uh, yeah, quite a lot of different styles of music. Um, and then we had like a two day uh, break uh, before the weekend, the last part of the festival. Um, on Saturday, we had a really nice um, a Baroque evening. Uh, one of my clients is, is playing a, a Baroque violin that I made uh, nine years ago. And he has actually a PhD um, <laughs> in Tartini, the famous uh, Italian composer, uh, Giuseppe Tartini. Um, so we had an evening in a really nice church in downtown uh, Oslo um, when he was playing together with an, a guy on, on uh, cembalo. Um, and you know, the funny thing with uh, these guys is, you know, they play Rococo or Baroque music, but they all play modern instruments. I mean, the, the cembalo that, that he was carrying in in the church, it was, uh, it was only 25 kilos light, uh, made in Germany two years ago. So, you know, uh, modern is the way to go. Um, and then um, the, last, the last day was maybe... You mean, the... you, mean, you mean modern, but based on traditional design? I mean, on... Yes, yeah. Mm. And then the last day, we, um, uh, we had a concert in... Um, um, in the, what do you call this in English? We say a mausoleum. Um, so, you know, the, where you, it's like, you know the word, Claudia? Yes, we say yes. mausolée in French. Mausolée, okay, so I guess you know what, uh, what I mean then. It's uh, where you, it's a buried uh, a yeah. place for burying and uh, celebrating death. Yes, kind of. So yes. I, I will show you, uh, I will show you some, some uh, pictures at the end. Uh, but it's, it's basically a famous Norwegian artist and he died, uh, I think around 100 years ago. And he made this beautiful building in, in, in stone, uh, which on the inside, it's a bit like a tunnel. So the, the ceiling is really high, maybe like 15 meters. And it's, it's arched, uh, like a half arch. And, uh, and, and, the, um, and the, the floor is in, in stone. So really, um, you know, it's, the acoustics are the reverb you say in English, I think it's around 15 seconds. Okay. So you-, you That's if, huge, wow. Yes. So if you, if you do like this, you will, you will hear the sound between 15 and 20 seconds. It, it, it uh, depends on how many people you have in there, okay? And, and the whole thing is, um, there's almost no, no lightning at all. And uh, uh, there are paintings on the inside of the ceiling. So this artist, uh, he painted it himself. He, he spent like 20 years uh, on his, before he died. And then when he died, he was, uh, he was uh, incinerated and he's, uh, he's inside a small vase, which is above the door when you enter the building. So, you know, you're actually quite, you know, like bowing for this guy. It's a very <laughs> special uh, and daunting place, but uh, it was really nice to work there with the musicians because I asked uh, two quite, quite young um, uh, violinists, which I knew were, I, I talked to them beforehand and I said, okay, so I want to do a concert in this very special place, but you know, you have this really long reverb. Are you, are you able at all to play violin in there, you know? It's, <laughs> and then they said, well, I don't know, it uh, looks hard, you know? And then we, we went for Christmas and we did some tests. Uh, we brought a couple of violins and, and started playing. In, and, you know, my, my, I had goosebumps. It was uh, such a sensation. And I said, okay, well, you know, we just have to go for this. Um, uh, so they, they put together a program, which was a mix of, you know, uh, some some uh, some older music like Bach, and uh, they also played some modern music like Steve Reich, and they did so many hours of uh, practicing in this special room that they actually adapted the way they played the violin, and and that was the most striking thing for me as a listener, uh, because from the first time I went there on sound check with the musicians until the last evening with all the concerts. They had four concerts in, in a row in, in one evening, all sold out because, you know, people were really um, 
in, really interested to see or and also hear what was uh, going to happen in there. Um, and it's all uh, it's all recorded. So yeah, I, I know in the workshop this week I'm, I'm listening to all the, the the high definition audio files from the older recordings, and uh, it's great fun to. Uh, release it and I, I hope I will be able to release some of it uh, but that's a long way to go I'm, I'm kind of you know talking to record labels and, and stuff like that but I, I, I do think it should reach, reach um, a bigger audience uh, I can show you some photos um, uh, let me share again here So let's move to the next one. Okay, so can you see it now? Okay, uh, so okay, so this is the post the poster for the festival. Um, um, this is the first hall, which I told about the old, um, yeah, kind of a Rococo style building. I mean, this one in France would have been a kindergarten or something, but uh, in Norway, it's a museum. <laughs> So that uh, says something about uh, you know the age. Um, this is from the Beethoven uh, evening. Uh, there was an old Steinway in there as well, which we got uh, tuned and up and running for the concert. Um, this is from the church concert. So um, Sigurd Imsen is a he's a brilliant baroque uh, violinist. You can check him him out on, on Spotify and all the places. Uh, and there you see the old uh, cembalo, which uh, Christian Schulz is playing there, uh, made in, in Germany two years ago, no, uh, four years ago. Uh, and this is the inside of the mausoleum, which I just uh, told about. It's, it's very hard to uh, replicate the feeling um, in a photo, uh, but uh, as you see the, the insides of the of the building is old mm, well a bit special a bit erotic uh, paintings but um, it's an homage to you know the life of the humans and it kind of depicts the, you know the, the how we travel as you know from small kids uh, until we die as you can see in the lower right so it's quite dramatic but um, and for the photo we just put a lamp here to to see the to see the painting but usually it's almost pitch dark in there so you get in and as you can see the the, the public was were sitting in two rows uh, facing outwards and the musicians were standing in the middle of the room playing so uh, the public could not see the actual musicians and that added something extra to the experience uh, i think okay so, uh, any questions? I have a question about um, what did you, I mean, it was obviously an enjoyable experience. Did you learn something about your own making or does it make you, yeah, what did it bring as a maker? As a maker, it, um, it gives me a bigger uh, perspective on listening to, um, the same instruments in different uh, in different rooms, and I think you know, as time passes by, I realize more that, uh, for example, talking about you know playing in an instrument is something also Claudia we discussed when you were in Norway, and um, and and you've been doing some research on this, and I think it's really interesting to. You know, when I started as a violin maker, I was thinking that okay, so you play in a violin. And that is something that is happening with the instrument itself within the first years of existence. But now I think really more there's something about, you know, the instrument uh, is adapting and the musician from the other side is adapting and they are, you know, really linked to one, uh, one each other. And a good example of that is if you have really a really good player who's able to kind of maximize the sound or to find the, the right contact point of the instrument straight away uh, they can you know make a violin sound pretty good from the first moment um, 
but if you have a musician that is used to playing the same instrument every day for 30 years and they pick up another violin, it's very hard for them to adapt. Um, so that is something that I learned more about. And, and also uh, a bit about, you know, the, the different characteristics of the model that, models that I've been using. Because, you know, like I told uh, earlier, I, in the beginning I was using Strad and Guarneri and Ruggeri and all the, the old Italians. And then uh, hearing those instruments now together with what I'm doing now on my, on my personal model, it, that was really yeah, a re revelation and very enlightening experience. Okay, would like, would anybody uh, like to comment, ask questions? Yeah, come on, we have six minutes. <laughs> yeah. People are tired, I can imagine, after uh, varnish and... Uh... Well, at least your talk is not, you know, you don't really need to concentrate hard to understand what you're talking about, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear, <laughs> that so was the goal. <laughs> it's a nice way to finish the day. Yeah, okay, thanks.